I've got to talk to you about this guy, Adam Rubenstein. I know you've been oh. commenting on this. This is yeah. while we're on this subject of media. We'll end it on a, night, on a, on a lighter yeah. note. So this is one of the guys who was at the Times when that whole Tom Cotton op-ed on what we should do with the rioters in the wake of George Floyd and whether the National Guard should be used to maintain order in the cities, um, he right. got he got caught up in all of that. There was the, the top guy who got booted um, eventually out, James Bennett. And then there was this guy who said he was kind of, it sounds like he was second in command on the on the Times side for this article. And he has written a, like a full download of what happened to him in the Atlantic. The title of which is, I was a heretic at the New York Times. I did what I was hired to do and I paid for it. And we'll get to all of it, but we've got to begin, of course, with the opening paragraph, which I know you've read. Of course. It reads as follows. On one of my first days at the New York Times, I went to do an orientation with more than a dozen other new hires. We had to do an icebreaker, pick a starburst out of a jar and then answer a question. Oh, Lord. My starburst was pink, I believe, so I had to answer the pinked prompt, which had me respond with my favorite sandwich. My God. Russ and Daughter's super heapster came to mind, but I figured mentioning a $19 sandwich wasn't a great way to win new friends. So I blurted out the spicy chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A and considered the ice broken. Now, you or I could have told Adam that that was a mistake in front of the New York Times. So I think as soon as you say Chick-fil-A, if you spend any time on the right or consuming any sort of left or right of center media, you know that this is, this is a trigger word for the left. Adam finds out the hard way. The HR representative leading the orientation, because there's always got to be some big boss there, you know, corralling your language, chided me, quote, we don't do that here. They hate gay people. <laughs> Didn't you know? You're, you're supporting mm -hmm. gay hatred if you eat the chicken sandwich. Right. People started snapping their fingers. My God, is everyone there 17? In acclamation. I hadn't been thinking about the fact that Chick-fil-A was transgressive in liberal circles for its chairman's opposition to gay marriage. Not the politics, the chicken, I quickly said, but it was too late. I sat too down late. ashamed and things did not get much better for Adam from there. So what do you make of his, his look back at how he was, his yeah. career was basically ruined over that, that uh, Senator Cotton op-ed? No, so this this is like a microcosm of all the problems with the media. Um, the whole story is is worth reading. This Chick Fil A thing in in particular. Can I just note that a bunch of people on Twitter, like the Nicole Hannah Joneses of the world, are saying we don't believe that this anecdote happened. Well, I've written at the Atlantic. They do a lot of fact checking. Um, I imagine they have some backup for this. And also, all oh. of us believe that this happened because. We all Look, know what if I took if I took a sack of Chick-fil-A into a room filled with the Chick-fil-A truthers who are saying this never happened and said, I got you guys lunch, they would call me out. They would say <laughs> it's hateful for me to bring that chicken to them. We all know this. And yet they Did you say Chick-fil-A truthers. Yes. <laughs> You're right. That's, That's what, what they are. Doing. I saw her. I saw her saying it's not true. Meanwhile, like now all the friends of this guy, Adam, are like, he told me the story of the Chick-fil-A at the time. It's turned yes. into this whole thing. It has. So, but the whole story is, is really bad. And what it, what it illustrates is not only that uh, this newspaper did not have Rubenstein's back at all. He was a, you know, a mid-level opinion uh, editor. He goes through all the right channels to publish this perfectly reasonable op-ed from a senator of the United States of America, that a position, by the way, with which that he's expressing that most Americans agreed with at the time, which is that maybe we should have some uh, military authority use some muscle to try to break up the uh, the riots here. Now, it made a distinction between protests and riots. They pretend it didn't, but it did. Um, this is, should have been non-controversial in the paper of record. However, it was not non-controversial. And what happened was Rubenstein got called out by name in public by the New York Times as the person responsible for this op-ed, which all of the staffers at the New York Times, having never been exposed to anyone who disagrees with them in their media uh, journey from Ivy League to the New York Times, uh, that they said it made them unsafe. It made mm -hmm. them unsafe, Megan, to see words that they disagreed with. Words. Uh, and unfortunately, words are... the staff at the New York Times and the, the higher ups are, were either in agreement on this or too cowardly to say, no, you guys are wrong about this. And oh, Rubenstein yeah. I mean, is the, the one who took the fall. The details 
about what happens in the New York Times Slack channel, which should be abolished yes. immediately. I mean, these people are so dumb. Get rid of the Slack channel. Do not let the little hens get in there and cluck away. Are you going to wind up with, you know, a thousand of these situations, which they already have? Um, yes. He says he's conservative. <clears throat> he said he wrote for the Weekly Standard for a bit and the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. So we should have known about the Chick-fil-A. But he says... Um, it was a tr strange experience to be, you know, conservative or at least considered one at the times. I often found myself asking questions like, doesn't all this talk of voter suppression on the left sound similar to charges of voter fraud on the right? Only to realize how unwelcome such questions were. By asking, I'd revealed that I wasn't on the same team as my colleagues, that I did not accept as an article of faith the liberal premise that voter suppression was a grave threat to liberal democracy while voter fraud was entirely fake news. Same yeah. thing happened to him on the Hunter Biden laptop story, and then there's this. There was a sense that publishing the occasional conservative voice made the paper look centrist. But I soon realized that the conservative voices we published tended to be ones agreeing with a liberal line. It was also clear that right of center submissions were treated differently. They faced a higher bar for entry, more layers of editing, and greater involvement of higher ups. Standard practice held that when a writer submitted an essay to an editor, the editor would share that draft with colleagues via an email distribution list. Then we'd all discuss it. But many of my colleagues did not want their name attached to op-eds, advancing conservative arguments, and early to mid-career staffers would routinely oppose their publications, their publication entirely. They didn't even want their name associated with being an editor on it. So upsetting were the views of literally half the country, MK. No, this is the opposite of thinking. This is the opposite of inquiry. And Adam Rubenstein walks in there as a center-right person. <laughs> like, just like, I, I know that feeling. Everything I he wrote, I was like, I, I know exactly what he's feeling, right? Because you see things slightly differently. And in a newsroom that was interested in finding news and facts and understanding the way people see the world, uh, they would say, oh, interesting. That is a different way of looking at that. Can you please explain that to us? But actually the virtue for New York Times staffers is as he notes, to already have a position, to take this as a given that whatever thing the left believes is already true, done and done. You're done. You don't have to think about it at all. Um, but the act of news gathering should be about thinking. It should be about rationally evaluating fact versus uh, versus. Uh, quotes and scenarios and an explanation from different sources and what their motivations are. But like the call is to not do that on the left. It's just to take in whatever the line is and agree with it. And then they surround themselves with nobody who disagrees. And mm -hmm. someone like Rubenstein gets the, either takes the fall or gets the boot, right? If yeah. you object so, to this. Somehow he got in. So that's, this is how, know. you know, Barry Weiss left the New York times too. I mean, she was in particular on Israel outraged, at their one-sidedness, wound up leaving. Uh, this guy, James Bennett, wound up leaving. The, I'll give you one, one last paragraph here because it's worth it. He, he writes about how it went down when, before the op-ed by Cotton was published and some of the back and forth he had with his higher-ups there before you know they hit print. And he, he writes, I had one more task to take care of before it printed. Cotton's office had emailed me several photos that they wanted to see published alongside his op-ed, showing times when the same legal doctrine had been invoked in the past. One was of U.S. troops enforcing the desegregation of the University of Mississippi in 1962. I sent these to a photo editor, and he names names, Jeffrey Henson Scales, and asked him to consider them. He wrote me back to say, quote, a false equivalence, but historical images are there now, meaning he had add, added them to the story file in the system. I thanked him and added a confusion emoji, emoji in case he wanted to expand on what he meant. He replied by sending me the emoji of a black box representing yeah. solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Done and done. Did, Argument did made. you and I write this in our in a fever dream or did this really happen? No. Like, no, it's amazing. And by the way, he names names for a reason uh, on that photo editor because that photo editor leaked his uh, slack against company policy to the New York Times own reporters who were reporting on right. the placing of an op-ed in their own paper. And they misrepresented the chat to make him look as if he was uh, admitting to, to inaccuracies in the piece. Like they completely mm, lied. That's about. right. That's right. Yeah. That's actually a whole other piece. That's a lengthy piece. Guys. Right, where he talks about how the New York Times, once it went into a full meltdown about the fact that they had published the piece and there was all this blowback, um, 
that they just lied. R reporter after reporter, editor after editor, executive after executive just decided the only way to handle this was, we all hate Tom Cotton. Some rogue employees got out of control and uh, didn't do the crazy. proper vetting, right? That's that's what this is. And really, you know, he exposes on now. It's not what happened at all. They're just cowards. Do you owe back taxes? Pandemic relief is now over. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Oh, joy. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. Mm -mm. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10 grand or 10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay or you are on a fixed income, they can help financially resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call 1-800-245-6000 for a private free consultation or visit tnusa.com slash Megan. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.